Hi guys, I'm Grace reporting for On The Map Off The Radar um, and today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about Burundi. As some of you may know, um, there have recently been protests that have broken out uh, against the current president. Um, so I'm just going to be giving you a kind of brief overview of those and also talking a bit about the history of the country. Um, you know, again, this is just, you know, my take on it based on a couple of sources. It's not kind of definitive because this is a very controversial um, topic. So, um, Burundi was ruled, uh, was colonized, sorry, by the Belgians as part of Rwanda Urundi. Um, and they obviously ruled it according to the Hamitic hypothesis in which they systematically privileged the Tutsi against the Hutu. And this has had profound, um, this uh, along with a number of other um, important tensions during this period, have had profound consequences for the post colonial histories of both Rwanda and Burundi. Um, so, but the ethnic structure of Burundi is slightly different to that of Rwanda. In Burundi, there was a monarchy that retained quite a lot of power, um, and within the Tutsi um, ethnic group, there was uh, a distinction between the Abanyoruguru, who were kind of closer to uh, the royal family and mainly resided in the north, and the Hima Tutsi, who um, were slightly kind of less socioeconomically um, privileged um, than the Abanyoruguru and lived mainly in the south, along with the Hutu population. So in 1972, after President Mikombero and his Uprona party had taken power and established a republic, banishing the king, um, there was um, the king, sorry, the king returned. Um, and President Mikombero, who was a Hima Tutsi and surrounded by a Banyuruguru Tutsi, which led him to feel very threatened, was uh, really concerned by this uh, return of the king. And so a lot of people have said that, uh, yeah, that he felt very vulnerable at this point. In 1973, a rebellion broke out in the south of the country, um, which was a Hutu rebellion, and these Hutus went around basically killing Tutsis. Uh, and in response, um, the government basically massacred what Rene Le Marchand has cited as between two and three hundred thousand educated Tutsi. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hutu, sorry. Um, this which basically eviscerated any potential uh, Hutu leadership. Um, and a lot of people said this was a completely disproportionate response to a very small rebellion that occurred because of the vulnerability that uh, Mikombero um, was feeling, both with regards to the Hutu and also with regards to the Eban Yuruguru. Um, and so uh, this was completely underreported, uh, partly because those who committed the genocide stayed in power until, um, you know, into the future. Uh, and so in 1988, again, there were more uh, killings of Hutu um, and the Tutsi government was still in power. And this was you know, a very tense period up until 1992, when a referendum um, was, uh, you know, occurred, which paved the way for multi-party democracy um, and elections. These elections occurred in 1993, and uh, a Hutu president was elected. But almost immediately afterwards, he was assassinated by uh, Tutsi army officers. Um, and then members of the former president's party took revenge on the Tutsi, and a huge civil war broke out which lasted until 2005 um, and various Hutu groups which had been exiled uh, formed guerrilla groups in places like Eastern Congo and in Tanzania and fought against the government um, in mainly in the countryside. So this war lasted until 2005 and killed an estimated 300,000 people. Um, eventually some peace agreements, well peace agreements were tried throughout this period but eventually they managed to get the CNDD FDD, a major Hutu uh, rebel group, on board and in 2006, um, the kind of the peace was consolidated, and a power sharing agreement uh, and a transitional government was put in place with Pierre Nkurunziza in uh, Hutu in power. Um, and this very uh, fragile ethnic compromise was sustained through authoritarianism and human rights violations against the opposition and also widespread patronage and corruption. And this leads us into today. Um, so why there have been protests against Nkurunziza. He's seeking a third term, even though he's constitutionally limited to a two-term presidency. Um, and uh, he says that he was appointed in his first term, so that doesn't count. Other people say that, you know, this is completely unconstitutional and he needs to step down. Elections are scheduled, uh, they were scheduled for June 26th, they've now been pushed back. Um, and uh, these protests are basically, and they've been going on for a while, for a couple of months now, and they continue to this day. And we have yet to find out um, what will happen. Nkurunziza is still you know, holding on to power, um, and the protests, as I said, uh, continue. 
uh, as yet, they have not turned overly violent. About 20 people have been killed and around, according to the UN, 100,000 people have been displaced. Um, but there is some concern that the youth wing of the CNDD, FDD might get involved and this might turn into a violent conflagration. But we are hoping that it will, that this will be able, you know, will keep a lid on things and um, that the election will pass freely and fairly and the Burundian people will be able to st take a new step in, you know, constructing a f their future after this really violent period of their history. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I've been great reporting for On the Map, Off the Radar, and I will give you some links to the sources that I've been using um, for this video in the description. So thanks very much um, and goodbye.